Hello and welcome to The Doc Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike DeLuke, and it's my mission to help you lead a happier, healthier, and more prosperous life, both personally and professionally. Today, I am joined by a true pioneer in the area of 3D imaging and dental sleep medicine, Dr. Bill Harrell. Dr. Harrell completed his orthodontic residency at the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine in 1977. He's an ABO certified orthodontist who is also certified in dental sleep medicine. Dr. Harrell practices in Alexander City and Auburn, Alabama, and also teaches part-time in the orthodontic department at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Dr. Haler was the first orthodontic practice in the state of Alabama to have cone beam CT and the first in the USA to combine both CBCT and 3D facial imaging way back almost 20 years ago in 2005. He serves on the American Dental Association's Children Airway Screener Task Force, CAST, which we'll talk more about in this episode. And they're charged with developing a validated simple pediatric screening questionnaire called CGASP. Uh, for use by healthcare providers, as well as, very interestingly, school nurses to screen for airway issues in children from the age of 2 to 12 years old. He, in addition to that, he serves as the chair of RADCITE's Standards Committee on Setting Standards for CBCT Units for Medical and Dental Uses and Facility Accreditation. As if that's not enough, he's published numerous articles and is the lead editor of the textbook, Growing Into Breathing Problems, The Quest for Collaborative Lifetime Solutions. He's also a national and international lecturer on the topics of early orthodontic treatment and its relationship to airway issues in children, 3D imaging, TMD disorders, and diagnostics and management of sleep disordered breathing. So as you can see and tell, uh, Bill is a true expert in, in many, many areas that we discuss and hit on in the doc platform. Uh, and that's really one of the main reasons why I am super excited to have him with me as my guest today. Uh, and with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Bill Harrell to the show. Welcome, Bill. Hey, thank you, Mike. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to sit here and discuss some things that I have a real big passion about, for sure, about airway and and breathing and TMJ disorders and the rest. Yeah, thank you. And clearly from what you've dedicated to through your career and, and all you've done, um, amazing. And maybe you're a true pioneer in, in the arena of 3D imaging and understanding this uh, from an early stage and, and have kind of a fascinating story for that. So to start, just, just tell everybody a little bit more about how you even got into thinking about this uh, and, and, and if both from an airway perspective and just from an overall 3D imaging standpoint as well. Yeah, I started, I got, uh, went to dental school at Alabama and graduated in 1975. And then I went on to the University of Pennsylvania where I uh, did my orthodontic training, uh, graduated in 1977 and then opened my practice in Alexander City, Alabama. And uh, with a goal at that time, you know, come board certified and that, and then, you know, 1982, some articles came out, especially the Harville article yep. about the monkey studies. Yep, I love those studies with Harville, noses, yeah. You know, and, and creating malocclusions and altered facial growth in these monkeys that don't get malocclusions, mm -hmm. don't get normally, because these are these were purebred rhesus monkeys, mm -hmm. so they knew what the, the lineage was, and it kind of opened my eyes to go, well, you know, maybe what we were taught earlier about this whole thing being totally genetic, there's an environmental factor. We, we learned that in school, but you know, it kind of went over our heads a little bit. Mm -hmm. We had uh, a, an instructor at Penn that kind of talked about functional orthodontics and all that. And of course, like everybody else, we kind of thought he was way off. <laughs> in oblivion somewhere because <laughs> we were worried about mechanics and you know tips and torques by this when i was in school the the whole thing about and the straight wire plots okay had basically just been invented we actually heard larry andrews uh one-on-one -on -one. barney swain was one of our instructors with the graber swain text and mm -hmm. he had uh actually gone out taking ross course so we were getting a lot of that kind of information mm -hmm. in school and, you know, that kind of opened my eyes a little bit. I started looking at 
and then Ricketts, uh, you know, with, with a lot of the Ricketts stuff that we yep. were looking at, uh, he was talking about tonsils and adenoids and mm-hmm. things like that. And so it's funny, when I was in school, when I did my tracings of myself, I always traced out the adenoid tonsil and airway. Wow. I just did it as kind of a completeness because I was looking at Ricketts' analysis. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> didn't quite... You know, the bell didn't quite ring, but I was <laughs> doing it anyway. But then I started, you know, when when the Harbaugh article came out in 82, I really started looking at the lateral cephs at that time and mm-hmm. and looking at the tops of the adenoids a little bit better and refer, starting to refer them to uh, ENTs for that. Yep. Uh, then in 19, actually, a year after I graduated, and opened my practice, I guess, in 1978, mm-hmm. Dr. Bill Farah was uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. He's only about 56 miles from me. But for people that know a little bit about TMJ or maybe a lot about TMJ, Dr. Bill Farah and Bill McCarty were the two, really, the pioneers uh, in the area of TMJ mm-hmm. back then. And uh, so in 1979, I actually started satelliting up to Montgomery. And I, I worked with directly with Bill Fair and Bill McCarty uh, in in uh, the TMJ arena from 1979 to 1985. Bill died in 85. And so we were, you know, we were taking transcranial x-rays. We were looking at things. We had people from all over the world that actually mm. were coming in. Uh, for people that maybe don't know, Bill Fair was kind of the one, the pioneer that described the displaced disc, the mm. anterior reposition. You know, the anterior repositioning with reduction, without reduction, the locking, mm. the degenerative changes. Before that time, he literally told me he got kicked out of an ADA meeting in the 60s, late 60s, literally by talking about what he was talking about. There's an orthopedic problem, not a psychological problem. Wow. And he that was said, in the 60s, I, he said, huh? I literally got thrown out. My slides got thrown on the sidewalk and they said, redneck, don't come back, you know, go back to Alabama, don't come back here. Wow. Well, it wasn't too many years later uh, that uh, they started doing fluoroscopic arthrography. Yeah. They injected the dye, did a fluoroscope, and lo and behold, <laughs> <here's the laughs> disc, and yep. it's yep. up and in and out of place. So yep. then the whole thing switched, and, you know, he got his, his due. And an interesting thing, I guess, really during that time is I was able to go in and scrub in on open joint surgeries. Oh, neat. Okay. And with Dr. McCarty, because he was the one that actually did the uh, placation, you know, for the, for the displaced disc. And mm-hmm. you really don't get an understanding of the TM joint unless you're seeing, you know, live open joints. Now that mm-hmm. we're not doing it as much anymore because we're doing arthrography, but, but through that, through the normative study group, which Bill Fair and Bill McCarty started uh, back in the early days, we had a lot of doctors come through and you know, a lot of research efforts were done in that respect. And so Bill got kind of got his, I get it, his due, I guess, at that time when a lot of that started. But it was really was an orthopedic problem. Degenerative changes started. Mm-hmm. It was back in those days, you know, reciprocal clicks. Everybody kind of remember Dr. Farrah for, you know, we were, I would say we were chasing clicks, but when the displaced disc, when there was a certain place when the disc actually reduced, mm-hmm. people, a lot, a lot of people know about the Farrah splint with the mm-hmm. big ramp on it, which yep. holds the jaw forward. Yep. Uh, and quote unquote, we're recapturing the disc. Now, one thing that, the reason I kind of got involved with them, Dr. Farrah was real, uh, he was kind of upset with the orthodontist because he would send them to the orthodontist because now their jaw has been repositioned into a little bit different place and the teeth don't fit. Right. So right. either you got to do restorative dentistry or whatever. And so he liked the way, but when he'd send them to the orthodontist, what would happen? We'd take the splint out, put the braces on, start moving the teeth, and guess what? Everything fall apart. Yeah from the TMJ side. So he and I kind of figured out a way to keep the splint in place while we're moving teeth, which was challenging, but we'd cut the splint away and kind of do, I got to be good friends with Dwayne Drummond's 
Mm-hmm. Uh, at that time, he'd worked a lot with Ricketts. And Dwayne was kind of doing some similar things. We were tripoding the mandible, moving teeth. So mm-hmm. he and I kind of shared a lot of ideas. And uh, what we, the weird, the weird thing was that, and Michael Gelb and I are good friends. And mm-hmm. I actually knew Harold Gelb way back in the old days. He was good friends with Bill Fair because they kind of saw eye to eye about a lot of things. But uh, I've talked to Michael Gelb a number of times to say, you know, it's kind of crazy because we didn't know it back then, but we were probably treating airways mm. <laughs> with the anterior repositioning yep. splint. You know, yep. we were opening up airways in addition to helping the TMJ. Yep. So that kind of came on the scene. And then probably on into the 90s, uh, Dr. David Hatcher, who's an oral maxillofacial radiologist, probably the world he's the world expert in oral radiology mm-hmm. started beam reader but he and i got to be good friends basically from the tmj side you okay. know, from that side that's kind of how we started meeting each other and uh you know he was doing a lot with uh the quint sectograph at that time he had actually gone to mobile alabama to install a quint sectograph in the hospital mm-hmm. uh and for them to start doing TMJ Tomogram. And that's kind of why I met him probably in the mid or the early nineties, I guess okay. David and I got to be good friends. And from that, I kind of got interested a little bit more in airway with David about 1996. David had gotten wind of Yvonne Deuce and the new Tom cone beam CT image. Mm-hmm. And so I think it was in Dallas at the AAO. Uh, we got a kind of a behind the scenes look, and this was 1996, mm. at the output from the new Tom. Mm. And of course, I think it was like, I don't know if it was eight bit or something. I mean, it looked like scrambled eggs to me. Mm-hmm. But they were real excited about it and looking at it. And then, uh, so we, we kind of got the, the first look. And of course, in 2000, one, uh, the first one of the cone beams came over to the United States. Mm. Uh, Loma Linda, uh, Joe Caruso, they got the first one. David got it the next day and claims to be the first one that he actually used it on patient. <laughs> so, and I kept you know talking with him, and so I jumped in night in two thousand five. I told David, I said, you know, just kind of let me know when you think the time is right. Mm-hmm. And that was when uh, I had actually met when uh, ICAT, Imaging Sciences, actually met with uh, Predreg Sukovic, who had the, the software for mm-hmm. Cone Beam, and they met together and formed ICAT. Mm-hmm. And I was in the room when all that happened. So wow. I, I got that's that fascinating. Around wow. there. So actually in 2005, we got our first machine and uh, – you know, started looking at mainly for TMJ, but then for looking at then the airway kind of came back on the scene to me. And, and, uh, and then it just kind of kept evolving. And we actually, at that time, I got the three, uh, 3D MD facial camera system, mm-hmm. pretty expensive 3D camera. But the thing I was looking at too, on these patients is that from the face, I mean, you, you can see a child walk in the room. And tell if I got an airway problem. Just mm-hmm. looking yeah. at their face, the mouth breathing, the small nasal cavity, the dark circles under the eyes, the thing yep. called Denny sign, which is the little yep, the Denny Morgan lines. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so I started looking at these things, and I really started measuring it because now I've got a three D facial image, a true yep. image, true color, but I've got the true anatomy under it. You yep. can rotate it, you can cut it and slice it and measure it. And so I started looking at these faces that we were doing, and I'd take a plane and I would cut, like, the face so I could see the outline on each okay. side of the face. Mm-hmm. And as I started doing that, I found almost 100% of the time, the patient's left side of their face is flatter than the right mm-hmm. in this region. Kind of in that male art area. People, it's almost, I don't know why. I don't, I'm still not exactly sure. People say, well, it's the way they 
lay or maybe in the womb, it's the way they laid, or maybe something. That I don't know. There's a lot of different philosophies, but if you look at people, the left side's usually flatter. So then it kind of dawned on me, well, you know, that's where the sinuses are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so as we started looking at it in cone beam, sure enough, a lot of times the left sinus may be smaller than the right, or mm. if you look down in certain, if you cut the face and cut the cone beam at the same place, you can actually see that the bones may be a little bit different. Mm. And so we started with the 3D MD software, we actually started uh, co-registering the face to the cone beam. Mm. So what we would do is we would take the cone beam, it's got a cone beam skin, okay, mm-hmm. not real accurate, but it's, it's there. Mm-hmm. And then what you can do is you can take that face because it's one to one and then you co-register like right above the eyes, part of the bridge of the nose, maybe up under the eyes a little bit, not the mandible because it's going to be different, but Mm -hmm. you can co-register this and it'll map basically one to one. Mm -hmm. So then now you've got the true face on top of the cone beam. Not a, I'm not a real big fan of taking the 2d photo. Mm -hmm. And stretching it over there right, right. That just makes it pretty. But you're taking a flat piece of saran wrap with a picture on it, and you're stretching it over this thing, and it gets all distorted. It, yeah. it makes it look pretty, but it's not really accurate. But we started looking at that, getting more and more involved in it. And then I had met Dr. Steve Schindel. Schindel people call him Schindel. Dr. Steve Schindel, he was the chief of plastic surgery at Stanford. Hmm. And through David... And some others, we met uh, Steve Schindel and through <laughs> Dr. Schindel, then I met Dr. Christian Gimeno, mm-hmm. who basically Dr. Gimeno was one of the you know fathers of sleep medicine mm-hmm. and one of the ones that co- uh, discovered sleep apnea can actually start occurring in children. Mm-hmm. So through that connection, I met actually Dr. Gimeno, I met Dr. DeMent, who was the other guy that discovered sleep apnea and then Powell and Riley were two others all there at Stanford that were the kind of the core of the, of the sleep medicine part of Stanford. Mm -hmm. And so even though I not like Dr. Farrah, where I was actually in their office, Dr. Christian Gimeno and I kind of got to be good friends and we communicated a lot and he was real interested. He actually knew I was going to write this book and I was (laughs) My my goal was to try to get him to write a chapter or at least do a foreword, but we kind of didn't get didn't get far enough along with that. But anyway, you know, and so my I guess my passion started where I had an idea of okay, well, if we could if we could take this three D camera and start really analyzing the face, mm-hmm. maybe through AI or uh, something like that, to look at these different parameters that relate to maybe airway issues on a child's face. Maybe we could use that to go into schools. You know, the nurses go in and they check the spine, they check mm-hmm. the ear, right, the eyes, right. they check the mouth, they check all this kind of stuff. And I actually talked to the head of nursing at the nursing school at Auburn, Alabama about that. And she got real excited. So we haven't really, finalized all that i haven't gotten the software but yet all done yet but it would be a great idea to be able to go in and take maybe on a even on a cell phone i don't know if the iphones and all are going to be accurate enough to do it but still if you can take a an image of the face and actually have the ai analyze it spit out a report and say Mm -hmm. you know maybe this patient has five or 10 or whatever of the 30 or 40 biomarkers yep. uh, that are quantifiable yeah. and, and you could track them over time. How cool would that be? If you have questions about a clinical case or maybe a challenging practice management issue, or maybe you're a new doc who's starting a practice and doesn't know where to turn for advice. Doc's private one-on-one coaching platform is here to help you succeed in all these areas and more. Just go to theorthocoach.com and select coaching from the menu to enroll. And now back to today's podcast. Amazing. And I, it's just such a, uh, thank you for giving that history because I think, you know, I think sometimes we forget that the journey that everyone goes on in this profession and especially the younger docs out there, 
uh, who yeah. know nothing other than the technology we've had. I mean, to think about what you were doing going on 50 years ago, uh, 45 yeah. years ago, yep. to see this, clearly you're a visionary. Clearly you saw things maybe you did, didn't even really notice. Like you said, you were looking at TMJ. Then you start kind of extrapolating that into airway and meeting people and talking to people. And, and that, to me, is the beauty of this profession and of the sciences in general, that when we collaborate and we're open-minded and we – look at the history, which we're going to come back to a little bit more of yep. in a few yep. minutes. But when we look at our history, uh, I think it's fascinating to hear that the ADA in the 60s wanted nothing to do with the thought of, of TMD as we currently know it and, and reduction of, <laughs> of the, the dislocation with reduction, without reduction, uh, what's causing a click. And it was, it was a psychological phenomenon, phenomenon only. Um, and I think it, we could learn a lot from that. So thank you for, for explaining that that journey. Uh, and then ultimately, obviously, as a very early adopter of 3D imaging, you've seen a lot, you've done a lot. And, and that combination of the what's behind the skin, the face, and what you see when a, when a child walks in the room, or in this case, as you're saying, to the nurse's office, I talk to my residents all the time. I constantly am, am kind of trying to beat into their heads that the first thing we look at when we look at a patient should not be their teeth. We need to step back and look at the entire face and the growth and development of the face. We know faces. I mean, faces are what we do as orthodontists. Um, we have more training and growth and development in the craniofacial complex than, you know, than just about anybody out there. Uh, so if we can start to set these parameters and look at these these things and, and look at whether or not they have these allergic shiners, dark circles, the allergic crease of the nose, the Denny Morgan lines, everything you highlighted, chap lips even, you know, getting down into some of the things that could be indicators of breathing problems. So why do you think that in light of all that, and you sent me a great article from 1912 on Albert Ketchum um, and, yeah. and talking about, I want to read a couple quotes from it because I think it's, it's so important as you were again using that TMJ analogy of, of how we we're so resistant sometimes to the change, but I think it's really important to understand our history. So back in 1912, Albert Ketchum had an article in the International Journal of Orthodontia, and it talked about how, how rhinologists, now commonly called ENTs, and orthodontists need to work together to address lymphoid tissues and then from the, the otolaryngological side, and then develop the orthodontist would develop the arches, literally says develop the arches, to improve room for the tongue, talks about using intermaxillary elastics to bring the mandible forward and improve mouth breathing. Uh, it says when children um, still mouth breathe or snore after their tonsils or adenoids are removed, the orthodontist, and this is a quote, can establish a balance of the forces of occlusion and thus stimulate growth and overcome the arrested development by applying gentle pressure to the teeth, gradually widening the dental arches and placing the upper and lower teeth in their normal relations. And then the last thing I mentioned said, um, this is a large number of cases has been cited where children with constricted nasal spaces have developed efficient breathing spaces as a result of stimulation through the work of the orthodontist and goes on to talk about angle and angle. So, I mean, this is, yep. we've known about this. This isn't a secret. And, and so I think it's so important as we go forward to say, okay, we know there are these issues. It's really not debatable, even though some do debate it, but it really, I, I think it's beyond debate at this point that um, the way we breathe affects the growth and development of the face, right? Whether it's Moss's yeah. functional matrix in the 60s and going into the Harvold studies you quoted throughout the 70s and to the early 80s. So we know this, we've seen this time and time again. We know it in adenoid faces. I mean, we've known, we all learned about that for our boards in dental school. So it kind of stops there, though. So why do you think in the educational side, we don't go beyond that? Why do you think it it's not something we talk about more? Because if you ask most orthodontic residents, dental students even, how much they've had about airway and how airway impacts the growth and development of the face, most are going to say little, if any. So why do you think that's still the case? Yeah, it's kind of unfortunate because, you know, again, if you look back, I mean, Albert Ketchum, I mean, there's a Ketchum award. For the AAO, right? I mean, so it this is guy okay. Is like on the pedestal of of uh, of orthodontics, and um, 
I don't know. You know, it's really interesting how it kind of evolved because, you know, remember I, when we were in school, I mean, you know, it was all about mechanics and new wires and new tips and torques and, you know, all that kind of stuff that yep. that we got, it, you know, mechanical kind of things that we were looking at. And, you know, we were into aesthetics and facial beauty and which are all, which are all very important mm -hmm, sure. part of what we do. But, uh, I don't, you know, it's, I've thought about this too. Well, why, not, you know, because back a hundred years ago, <laughs> I mean, I mean, Edward Angle talk, started talking about mouth breathing as being one of the most major factors of malocclusion. Yep, 1907. And, I I love that quote. Yes. Yeah, and and then kind of proven that maybe not in humans, but in animals. But you can't do the animal studies anymore. The problem is everybody won't. Where is the research? Where is the thing yeah. that answers the question? Yeah. Well, the problem with that is, is you really cannot ethically or morally do the study correctly. Interesting. Can, can you explain that more? That's an interesting take on it. Because what you would have to do is take two big groups of children, even have their history before they're born, mm -hmm. the time they're born, and follow them from there to 60 or 80 years of age, kind of like the Bolton growth study. <laughs> right. so yes, to, can, yeah. This group you're going to treat and this yeah. treats, this group you're not going to treat mm -hmm. who dies from natural causes mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. who dies from airways, heart mm -hmm. disease, stroke. We know all these things are, we know that's the ultimate, you know, that's the end point of some of this thing is not breathing. Right. Mm -hmm. So you, you just, you cannot do the study that's going to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. You just, you just can't, you can't do that long. And mm -hmm. you can't Interesting. Do yeah. It. Yeah. So then you have to take these little tidbits of research, you know, and most all of them, you know, to try to handle a hundred or two hundred people or six hundred or thousand is kind of outside the scope. So we say, okay, we, if we can study thirty or fifty of them or something, mm -hmm. maybe that makes it. But then that you know, it's just just uh, like uh, they say, uh, you know, there's lies, there's damn lies. Excuse yes. me, and there's statistics. Statistics, yep. And you know, you can kind of make. <laughs> You can kind of make things or believe what what you want to, and I I guess I agree from a from a sometimes orthodox you know you get out of school what do you want to do you want to go out there and straight teeth make pretty smiles and all mm -hmm. that and that's not easy but it's it's consistent mm -hmm. when you throw in TMJ because I wear three hats I will have an orthodontic hat early treatment hat orthodontic hat TMJ hat sleep apnea hat. Mm -hmm. A lot of people can't. It's too much to kind of pile yeah, on. They don't. They don't want that much. I agree. And they don't yeah. want that much. And yeah. when you start treating TMJ patients, you got to listen to their war story. Mm -hmm. You got to hear. You got to sit down. You can't just go in, look in their mouth, and say, "Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do that." Same day start. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to go ahead and get the braces on. Go ahead and pay for it. Go ahead and get them moving the teeth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fit in that in that category. So when you start looking at TMJ and sleep, it's a different animal, especially mm -hmm. when you start looking at sleep, because that's a medical issue. Mm -hmm. And it takes it takes you, you've got to understand the, the medical side. A lot of this literature, it's not in our literature. It's in medical. Medical. Yeah, agreed. And, and we don't we don't read that literature. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of orthodontic I mean, uh, Audrey Yoon is a she's one of the co-authors in my book talking mm -hmm. about expansion, but she's published a lot in the medical literature mm -hmm. because that's where that's where a lot of this stuff is, and she works closely with the ENT and, and the whole group. She worked directly with Dr. Gimeno and all that, mm -hmm. and uh, so these are the kind of people that Rebecca Bacow that you had yep. earlier, mm -hmm. man. I mean, these are the pioneers in the area that are really pushing some of the envelope as Agreed. far as as what you know what's really happening. 
And the backlash, that's what I've been so shocked at is the backlash they receive for yeah. proposing this. And it's all under it's sort of the guise of what you said. Well, there's no research. There, there, there's there's no data. But when you really look at it, there are there's so much evidence. And I go through it on this show all the time and yeah. not to go through all that side of it today. But there's so much evidence and in, in this area to in the medical literature, but even some of the orthodontic articles that talk about the benefits of early treatment and understanding the relationship yep. between breathing and 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 grow craniofacial growth and development. And then the next step, I feel like we just ne don't necessarily learn what to do about it in residency too. So you're exactly yeah. right. I feel like we, it, it's a lot of hats to wear. Like it's really easy. And a lot of the, you know, there's not many consultants out there today who are really, and it's not, not consultants. I'm just saying that it's not, it's just not really the, the most marketable thing to be out there promoting uh, you know, understanding cone beam and looking at facial, doing facial analysis and spending extra time with your patients who have these other sort of out of the box issues. It's much easier, as you said, to take the 12, 13, 14 year old kid, decide whether any braces are Invisalign and, and get them started and, and go on from there. And I think yeah. what would be great for our profession to understand is you can do both. Uh, and if you don't want to do both, then you can refer as long as you refer. can recognize it, right. Then you can just refer the others out and there's still going to be plenty of patients for you to just fit into that box. But the educational component, and I talked about this with, with Rebecca, um, in the episode you referenced in how the educational institutions really aren't teaching this. And I think a big part of it is because most orthodontic residents, most younger doctors are not treating young patients. So they don't even know a lot of what you and I are talking about right here. So I think one of the main things we have to try to do as a profession is encourage our organizations, the ADA, the, a the AAO, to go in there and start to work with the schools to figure out ways to get the residents treating younger kids and comfortable treating younger kids and yeah. using some of the diagnostics. I mean, a lot of residencies today don't even have cone beam. They're not even using 3D imaging. Yeah. And I teach at UAB, and and I have to say something good about them. They're they're opening their eyes to all this a lot. That's awesome. I think part of it, it it gets back to the academic. You know, they're there. You go to orthodontic school. You're there for three years mm -hmm. to learn how to do orthodontic. Mm -hmm. And I tell, even when I lecture, and I lecture to general dentists who complain about us orthodontic stuff. But here's the problem: you're in that. You're in that environment for three years. You've mm -hmm. got to learn how to move teeth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to learn how to move teeth. Yep. And so the whole act, the whole thing has been geared toward, let's just wait till all the permanent teeth come in and mm -hmm. deal with that time because we're not really geared to seeing really, technically, if you're going to really get into airway stuff, you need to see them at three, four, five. Mm -hmm. Yep. Guess where I'm getting most of my referrals in that age group? From the meta physicians. Myofunctional therapists. Oh, my, and my functional therapist. Interesting. My okay. functional therapists are sending them, not necessarily the dentist, because mm -hmm. here's the other fallacy. And I think Sean Carlton, you know, Sean. Mm, yeah. California, yep. He gives a great lecture about the transverse dimension. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, he he's showing, there's an article, I can't remember the reference of it, that he references about, it's it's a cone beam study about the transverse dimension, mm -hmm. and it's not it doesn't it's not evaluated necessarily on the dental intermolar width, but on the skeletal, skeletal. Mm -hmm. intermolar width. Yep. Now the dental intermolar width is kind of a reflection, and if you got something less than thirty millimeters of intermolar width between the molars, it's highly highly correlated almost. I don't know 100%, but it's highly correlated to sleep at, mm -hmm. okay, less than 30. But you've got uh, what they did on this study is they not only looked at that, but they looked at the, the skeletal. Yes, inner, yep, I'm familiar with it, yes. The skeletal width. Didn't they find what like they, three to five millimeters it had to be, the difference? Yeah. In, yeah. And what they found was it doesn't matter about a crossbite because that's what everybody looks at. Thank you. Yes. If a dental crossbite, then we're going to expand. Yep. If no dental crossbite, that's the thing that the, the academics have looked at and said, yes. well, if there's no crossbite, there's no reason to expand. Yes. So, and there's a lot of the, 
I mean, I'm an older guy. I'm back in the old days, but I've seen the vision of this thing grow. Mm -hmm. But if I kind of look back in my, if if I were to take myself out and swim myself and say, okay, I'm going to only believe what I was taught in school, Mm -hmm. then I would believe the same thing. Well, you can't expand once all the permanent teeth come in because they collapse. And then you can't expand if there's no cross bite. Right. Well, the the problem is, is we're looking at a lateral step, a 2D lateral step, yep. and a 2D panoramic yep. x-ray. Yep. And we've got either digital or a physical model. Yep. That's all we got. And yep. we're making a we're making a diagnosis on that. And we're we dropped the frontal a long time ago. Broadbent was smart. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The initial ce- the inif- initial cephalometrics was a 3D. Well, they did use a mathematical formula to, to do a 3D exactly. construct of a PA and a lateral and yeah, of, a yeah, pati- a lateral. of a static patient. Uh, and it was actually, ironically, market forces that caused that to go away be- because it wasn't practical to sell or to implement in your office. Yeah, because so- you had to have a you had to have their cephalostat, which were 290 degree pictures taken yep. almost simultaneously. Yep. Now, now, Kelly Baumrin did something a little bit different where he did parallel 2D and then that was like a stereo pair. Yep, yep, the stereo pairs, fly yeah. Over the, fly over the surface of the earth or Mars and you're taking all these pictures. It's the same thing that, that cone beam is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's taking all these multiple views and it's merging everything together in this 3D model. And uh, actually, my <laughs> an interesting story about how I got involved in 3D friend of mine, uh, Dr. Ray Bolt, he's a general dentist in uh, in Auburn now, but he was doing 3D video games on an Atari computer back in 1982. <laughs> and he had me come over to his his office one day and he said, I got to show you something I've been working on. So he had the computer, instead of sitting upright and us looking at it this way, he had it laid down on its rear end mm-hmm. with the screen being parallel. So he handed me these little tethered 3D glasses. They were not the red and blue anaglyph. They were the liquid crystal shutter glasses. Mm-hmm. And you put these things on, and literally he had people like R2-D2 <laughs> walking around the screen. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden he had the floor come up off the screen, the floor separated, and this little airplane started flying around the (laughs) plane. I'm going, I'm kind of looking at it, trying to grab a hold of it like a hologram. (laughs) And it just dawned on me. I said, Ray, do you think we could make a skull out of that? Hmm. So we did some calibration stuff with the two, uh, the the lateral and frontal self, and I kind of used the broad bent acetate overlay to come mm-hmm. up with dots yep. in space. So we came up with orthographic landmark and we connected the dots mm-hmm. in a 3D stick figure thing and then projected it. And sure enough, here's the little thing. And wow. Looking around and I mean, you can see depth perception because wow. now your each eye is looking at it. So that actually in 1992, I did a grant, did an NIH grant got a phase one funded, never could get phase two funded. But back in those days, it was just, I was looking at it like a baby step forward into 3D. Mm -hmm. Taking a frontal, you could calibrate. We actually, with David Hatcher, we did some stuff where we had a a calibration target that we'd put on them and take a front and lateral step. And so with that calibration target, we knew exactly how they were related so we could make a 3d stick right right yep this time. and so ray and i would diddle around with it, make it stereoscopic where you could actually see depth perception of course when cone beam came on the scene that that uh then all of a sudden now you can really do it for real yeah <laughs> and, and and amazingly people still don't i mean don't want to implement cone beam and that's a that's a, an uphill fight so one of the cool things that uh, I think would be if you want to talk to me a little more about too, and, and again, your vision for these things and seeing many steps ahead of where most of us see and for sure where most of us are practicing. 
talk to me a little bit about kind of the nasal resistance side, the rhinomanometry, uh, what maybe some of the potential in that arena is, because I think the more sort of arrows we can throw at this to try to help educate and give people the tools that they can use in their office uh, to see this, because I've often said, Anybody who's changed a patient's life using the type of approach you're talking about that I talk about all the time, once you see that, once you feel that, once you do that, I've never met anybody who embraced this philosophy, started treating these patients younger, started expanding these narrow constricted arches younger, started seeing, and as a result, you when you do that, you will see numerous patients who have a transformation in their airway, in their personality, in, in, in their life when you see that and you have the gratitude expressed by the patient and the parents, it changes you. It really does. And I, everybody with whom I've spoken about this, who feels that, I think that's part of what, what burns the fire of our passion within us is knowing that this is possible. And, and on the flip side, saddening us that not everybody in our profession understands this or is willing to accept it. So the more ways we can try to get that message through. So one of them is looking more from the rhinomanometry standpoint. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Hey, everybody, be sure to check out the doc website where you can get access to tons of great information, including free educational content, access to private one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, ADA SERP recognized CE courses, and amazing patient testimonials. Just go to the orthocoach.com. That's the orthocoach.com. And now back to today's episode. Yeah, I, that's, it's really a, a, a great uh, tool because think about it just a minute. The, we, did, we talk about the maxilla and the man, okay? Mm -hmm. But the maxilla is not really a separate bone until the oral surgeon goes and cuts it away. Mm -hmm. It's the nasomaxillary complex. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the whole, this is the whole nasomaxillary complex. Mm -hmm. And you can't separate. I mean, one thing when you do it, when you're expanding, what are you doing? You're actually affecting the width of the nose. Now mm -hmm. it's a triangle. Yep. So you get less up in the nose than you do. But uh, it's it's really interesting. I got I met uh, Dr. Karen Davidson. Mm -hmm. She's a uh, she's actually an RN, but she's worked a lot in the whole area with ENTs about this and. I got to, I got to, uh, kind of the word on what's called full phase rhinomanometry. Mm -hmm. Rhinomanometry is the measure of nasal resistance in your breathing, your e inspiration and expiration. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you got small nares or whatever, you got more resistance. If you got a deviated septum, mm -hmm. you may have more resistance of of, of inspiration and expiration. Swollen turbinates, mm -hmm. swollen adenoids, all this because. It's like Dr. Gimeno said, Doc, I've got a quote that I'm putting the video in the book. There's actually a video on YouTube with Dr. Gimeno and Dr. Mike uh, Milligan. Mm -hmm. You ought to look up. Dr. Gimeno said, if you do not establish nasal breathing in a child, you have not treated that child. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to establish nasal breathing, especially at night. Mm hmm. Now, if they get stopped up, you know, they get a cold, that's, that's one thing. But right. overall, number one, a child should not snore, mm -hmm. even a little bit. Even a little bit. Mm -hmm. Even a little bit. And they should be, babies are obligate nasal breathers. Yes. And they can feed and breathe at the same time. Right. And you say, how can they do that? Because the, the epiglottis and the back of the, and the soft palate actually almost meet each other. Mm-hmm. So they can feed and they can breathe at mm -hmm. the same time. But when that starts to split off and come down, that's mm -hmm. what makes humans vulnerable to airway issues mm -hmm. is that because that splits off. And so uh, if the child snores, I've got one right now. What happens to the soft palate? It swells up mm -hmm. because it's traumatized. So the, Soft palate can swell up. They can have uh, a little bit, maybe a little bit more adenoidal swelling or mm -hmm. inflammation back there. Uh, so all those things need to be done, and you you need to, you know, ask the patient. You know, that's we'll talk about the cast committee in a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
but you know, do they snore? And so I met Karen Davidson online and got it, got to talking to her about rhino manometry and, and how that might be applicable to orthodontics. And so she and I've really gotten to be great friends and a, a huge amount. Of, she's a knowledge base <laughs> about this. Interesting story about her. She actually, uh, she, Dr. Uh, Klaus Vott in Germany was the guy that invented four phase rhino manometry. She got to know him real well. So he's still alive, pretty old, but still alive. But, but he's actually turned over all his stuff to her. She is like the, mm. she's got all the, all the information about that. But if you think about it, you know, we're dealing with nasal resistance. We won't, like Dr. Christian Gimeno said, you got to get the child nose breathing. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you measure that? If you don't measure it, you right. have no objective idea about what's going on. Right. So right. Why as an orthodontist, yes, I've got rhino manometry in my office, and I'm using it to measure before and after expansion, mm -hmm. advancement those kind of things. Uh, and there's others across the country that are doing that. But basically, you know, when you start expanding, maybe mm -hmm. even you dental alveolarly upright the teeth mm -hmm. and you're create, but because going back to the thing with Sean Carlson and the, and the, the narrowness of the skeleton, mm -hmm. even though they don't have crossbite, they may have narrow skeletal yes. issues. They may have a high arch palate with no yep. crossbite. The, cr the dental crossbite has nothing to do with the skeletal because they just got, they got good dental compensation. Compensation. Yeah. I always say the patient who has a narrow maxilla and no posterior crossbite actually has a more severe malocclusion, even though we don't classify it as such in right. our nomenclature, but they have a more severe malocclusion than the patient with a bilateral unilateral posterior crossbite and a yeah. flat mandibular curve of Wilson and yeah, a broad absolutely. mandibular arch. And that's not yeah. taught ever. I mean, we're taught all, I shouldn't say ever, but and I've ever heard taught. It's almost right. always taught that it's blasphemous. If you try to expand on a patient who's narrow and uh, doesn't have a posterior crossbite, you, it's like you said, you just put blinders on with the whole transverse and say, oh, they don't have a posterior crossbite. Yeah. We don't look at this. And yet, and one thing I want to mention that um, I brought up on with Rebecca, and I received some, some really great feedback from the audience on this, and uh, it's opened up some other doors of, of maybe trying to, to, to fight this a little bit, but uh, is part of the problem is that in our schools, uh, most of us, m many of our institutions are, are treating a high percentage of their patients who are on state funding Medicaid. Uh, and we use this, the profession traditionally uses the Saltzman index to score these patients for, for coverage. And so at UConn, where I was, we didn't get a chance to treat a lot of phase one because we saw patients at seven, eight, but our job was a screener. We were just kind of glorified screeners. And we looked and a lot of these patients were super narrow, super constricted, exactly who you're talking about, right? Narrow maxilla, uh, normal with mandible with a caved in mandibular arch, moderate crowding. What do we have to do? We can't, they score like very few points on, I think, what is it? Don't quote me. Maybe it's 24, 27 points you need to, to qualify. They score insignificantly on the Saltzman index, so they don't get covered. So what happens? They're relegated to a path of extraction because the only way then to make room for those teeth is to start a serial extraction pattern. So you end up as a resident really only experienced in treating four by extraction cases um, in that are in, in trying to just basically almost ignore the transverse at that point. So I really feel kind of for those listening – I'm well, I welcome any ideas or thoughts. You all can reach me at any point. My email I'll put in the show notes, but Dr. Mike at theorthocoach.com. I think we need to start to work together to try to figure out a way to lobby our, our through, through our organizations or directly through the, the politicians to start to get to the point where we look at this as a preventative proactive measure and stop excluding these patients from qualification for services who have uh, narrow arches, but don't have a posterior crossbite. Because you could take that same patient that we were just talking about and give them a broad mandibular arch, right? And give them a unilateral posterior crossbite and boom, qualified, right? You can go ahead and expand that patient. But you cave their lower arch in and make their malocclusion more severe. And because the index doesn't score for that, Pick it up. 
it doesn't pick it up. You end up leaving these patients. And so I think if we can help everybody understand our physician colleagues too, and, and really in the healthcare arena, we could save money for these patients and for the system and for everything else. Because if these patients aren't being treated pro properly and their arches expanded and their arches developed when they're young and making them nasal breathers, they are going to be more likely to have sleep apnea, sleep disordered breathing, which has all, all the, the comorbidities, comorbidities, all all the comorbidities you discuss, which yeah. tax and strain our healthcare system. So I think it's, it's really something that I, I feel, uh, and I have to give my wife credit for this as well. I was post episode kind of just venting to her about it. And like, you know, it just, why? And she said, you know, let, like use your platform. Let's start to get this out there. Start to get to these agencies to say, Hey, why are we scoring off this traditional system? I don't know when Saltzman index was developed, but I got to think it's many, many decades, um, probably yep. in the seventies, I would guess around then. Uh, so if not prior, so we have this old school index, why don't we adjust it and start to apply it? Because if the residents aren't treating these patients the way you're talking about and looking at these things, then I feel like there's a big deterrent to them to ever start to do it once they leave school and go to private practice. Yeah. I think one thing too, you know, when we had, when we have pay, patients that have crossbite and, you know, that, those are some of the ones that, you know, it's maybe six, seven, eight that might come into the orthodontic clinic because they got a cross bite. Yeah. And that's kind of the ones that we're starting to see them a little bit earlier at UAB now. Thank good. You. And, it, and I think it's good. But we might see those and go, okay, let's uh, let's expand. You know, maybe they have a mandibular shift. Mm -hmm. So you put the RPE in or whatever, mm -hmm. and you start expanding. And then where do you stop? Well, you stop when the lingual cusp of the upper mm -hmm. get on top of the buckle, buckle cusp of, lower. of the lower yep. and we stop there and we go okay but we got very little and then we look at the research and we measure even they're doing comb beam studies or we look at the nasal cavity and say well we got very little change in the nasal cavity maybe we didn't get any nasal resistance mm -hmm. in help at all mm -hmm. the problem is you haven't expanded them enough why mm -hmm. Because you haven't uprighted the lower. Right. You're limited by the lower arch. Have, yep. If you're going to expand the upper, you have got the, a lot of times what happens on the lower is their dental. There's a lot of dental alveolar collapse. Is yes. What we're talking about. Completely. Right. And if if the lower has dumped in and then the upper is dumped in and there's no crossbite, the teeth are. That's why you have to look at a cone beam from yep. the funnel to evaluate. What are the what are the teeth look at? What's the bone width, nasal width? Yep. And then that's where rhinomanometry comes in. There's three things with the nasal resistance. Number one is four phase rhinomanometry, which measures you put a mask on, you measure, you have them breathe in and out of their nose naturally, mm -hmm. and you see the inspiration expiration curves. And okay. there's ways to know. There's another one called acoustic rhinometry, mm -hmm. which uses an acoustic uh, sound like sonar. Okay. It moves sonar down the tube, and then it it will map out the uh, the structural part of it. Okay, where might that obstruction be? And there's like a a normal curve that it's supposed to follow. So either if you're above the curve average or above acceptable mm -hmm. acceptable if it's below the curve and where does it occur does it occur right at the entrance of the nares does it occur at the at the tip of the terminate mm, right so right you can kind of get that then there's a third one called penith peak nasal inspiratory flow meter okay and it's a simple little device it's got a face mask it's got a tube and then inside the tube is a scale, and it's got a little round red wafer that fits inside this little uh, cylinder. Mm -hmm. And so you you take it, and up here is the mask. Uh, at the top is the mask. Okay. And at the bottom is the bottom of the little tube. You you pop it down, and a magnet comes down, and it hits that little red wafer, and it puts it all the way at the bottom. Okay. Then when you put it, but then when you turn it back over, the magnet goes to the top. The red wafer stays at the bottom. Okay. So then you put this thing on, and you inspire as quickly as you can. You go, 
and then that little red wafer will move up the up the thing. So okay. depending on age and sex and all that, there's no like magic number. Karen's got a uh, an actual uh, algorithm called Daffy okay. that you plug in the age, the sex, and some other things. And then you say it's for if at this age, mm -hmm. it should be about here. Okay. And she does the same thing for four phase rhino manometry and all. So it's kind of based on the individual. Mm -hmm. It's not like a SNA should be 82 degrees. Right, right. It's not plus or minus something. It, it varies in a lot of respects. Now, the other thing that's being pushed a lot is pharyngometry, acoustic mm -hmm. pharyngometry. People use that a lot to quote unquote figure out where to put the mandible of a patient that we're good doing an oral appliance on. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem with that. And we're looking at the pharyngeal area in a cone beam too, right? Because mm -hmm. that's yep. where we measure out the airway. Yep. And we say, look how wonderful we can move the mandible. And look how big we make the pharyngeal airway. Mm -hmm. Here's the fallacy behind it. Karen and I co kind of coined the term wine bottle theory. Mm. You got a wine bottle here. You got a base that's really big. Mm -hmm. It holds a lot of wine. Mm -hmm. But then you got this little narrow top going up. Mm -hmm. Where's the resistance? It's in the upper, it's in the nasal cavity. Mm. You can make the wine bottle as big as you want to. Mm -hmm. You can make the pharyngeal area here. Yep. But they may still have a problem. They may still mouth breathe. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've made them a better <clears throat> mouth breather. <laughs> right, right. But you had nothing yeah. to get the nose. So you can't ignore, we as orthodontists, we can't ignore the nose. Mm -hmm. ENTs and orthodontists should be tied to, at the hip. Completely I mean, agree. Um, it changed the way I practice when I had the relationships with my ENT colleagues through my cleft yeah. facial team. I, it totally changed the way I look yeah. at the so growing I'm face. I'm trying yeah. to work at it UAB to get to get ENT and orthodontics together. I and, love that. And learn each other's stuff because mm -hmm. we are it's so interrelated to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's. I think that's such a great point. And um, looking at it for you know, as you're speaking, I'm thinking, oh my gosh. It makes so much sense. Understanding, we we know the studies are there. I mean, we've yep. said horrible many times, but the studies are there to show that if we are not breathing through our noses, our faces don't grow correctly. Uh, and then there's all sorts of other comorbidities involved and in gozal studies and getting into the the brain matter and 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 ADHD and all all the other comorbidities that that exist out there. So we know yeah, this. An interesting study. I've got it in my presentation where. They did functional MRI, a three Tesla, I think it was a three Tesla machine, a functional MRI on mouth breathers versus nose breathers. Mm -hmm. So the patient was their own control. Mm -hmm. So they had a mouth breathe for a while. They had a okay. nose breathe for a while. Okay. Guess what? More of the intellectual centers of the brain were stimulated doing nose breathing. Mm -hmm and less during mouth breathing. Mm -hmm. And if you look, there's actually a YouTube video too about a patient breathing and watching and functional MRI and watching the brain, watching the brain stem uh -huh. pumping up and down like this as you're breathing. And there's a difference when you mouth breathe, breathe. versus nose breathe. So, you know, we think we orthodontists are just trying to sit here dealing with pretty teeth and right. right we're dealing with some heavy duty stuff here and we need to try to realize it and we need to work with medical professionals that's kind of why the book i kind of wrote this book i had an idea on it a long time ago and it's kind of just it's coming to tuition now <laughs> yeah, and if you can maybe go off of that and talk a little bit about cast the children's airway screener yeah 
task force with the ADA and how that, because these are the types of things that need to happen, developing yeah. ways to get this into people's hands in our profession, conversations like we're having, obviously, and starting to you know continue to raise awareness, yeah. but also have ways for them to kind of quantify this and, and analyze this within their offices so that they know, and then knowing what to do with that data. So talk a little bit about that if you could. Yeah, this is really interesting. Uh, Steve Carstensen is a general dentist in Seattle. He practices strictly adult sleep apnea. Okay. That's all he does. He's on. He's chairman of the pediatric sleep committee for the American Dental Association. Steve is. Uh, he's a board certified uh, dental sleep medicine through the uh, American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. And Jerry Simmons, who is one of my co-authors, both of these are co-authors in the book, but. Jerry Simmons is triple board certified in neurology, epilepsy, and sleep medicine. Wow. He's an MD. Steve and Jerry went to the ADA, American Dental Association, mm -hmm. a while back and were instrumental in forming this committee, this pediatric sleep committee for the ADA. Mm -hmm. So both of them, actually Jerry is an MD, is one of the co-chairs of this which mm. is kind of unheard of mm, yeah. for an MD. That's great. So this whole thing, so I'm on this committee. It's called Children's Airway Screener Task Force. So what we've been, and a number of us are on there. There's a number, there's some myofunctional therapists on there. There's dentists, there's physicians. Uh, so what we wanted to do is come up, there's a lot of these sleep questionnaires, pediatric sleep questionnaire. Mm -hmm. There's 20 something questions. There's a lot of these things. We're real specific about things, which are great. Mm -hmm. But what we've been tasked with is look, can we come up with a simpler, maybe five questionnaire mm -hmm. that answers five simple questions that mm -hmm. the parent will answer from a child from two years to 12? We pick that category. Mm -hmm. At questions like, does your child snore? Do they have restless sleep? Have you witnessed them gasp for breathing? We don't talk about ADHD, but we talk about behavioral issues or mm -hmm. how they do it well in school or blah, blah, blah. And so it's five simple questions. Yes, no, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So any yes answer basically elicits, hey, this child needs to be evaluated by somebody. Okay. okay, whoever you might refer them to. And it takes less than a minute for the parent to do this. And mm -hmm. we also, part of that, Kevin Boyd, he's a pediatric mm -hmm. dentist in yep. Chicago. I mean, he treats them the day they're born, um, <laughs> yep. which is good. But I mean, I can't treat them quite as young as he does. But anyway, but we've also, as part of that, uh, that CAST committee, there's a thing called CGAS. That's actually the screening form. Mm -hmm. Children's General Airway Screening Protocol is what that means. It's, it's online. So dentists, I would recommend, you know, orthodontists or people that deal with young children, especially pedodontists or whatever, deal from 2 to 12. Maybe uh, we're looking for practices to because we're starting the pilot study right now. Okay. Could you give me a link to put in the show notes for people to click on to get can, more information on that? Yeah, I can. I give you. I, I'll give you Jerry Simmons' uh, contact information. Okay. Perfect. So you can, because we're looking for these. What we're gonna do? This is what we now we got. We we got to get the funding for this thing because ADA's put in some. We've got actually gotten a, a few little funding things. But here's what we want to do. Have you heard about the Doc Community on Facebook? It's where you can get access to more great content, including case reviews, select clips from CE courses and podcasts, literature reviews, and exclusive promotions and discounts off Doc educational materials. Just go to Facebook and search for the Doc Community and submit a request to join the group. And now back to the podcast. We're going to take this five questionnaire screener and we want to validate. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we validate now? Part of the screener, you check off the parent checks off the question, mm -hmm. but we want any, we want all children, not just the ones you think have sleep issues. Got it. We, mm -hmm. we want people in the study to check all no, 
Yeah. yeah. Be basically, basically part, part of the medical history that they're filling the out. Yep. Mm -hmm. Part of that online thing, the dentist or the hygienist will fill out. Is this primary, mixed, or permanent dentition? Mm -hmm. What's the classification? Mm -hmm. in, in the primary dentition and the per permanent dentition, what's the classification? Uh, is there slight amount? Is there even slight amount of crowding of the lower? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the intermolar width? Mm -hmm. Inner canine width, inner motor width, and primary dentition, mixed dentition, or permanent. Mm -hmm. What's the inner motor? Mm -hmm. What's their facial pattern? Is it short, normal, long facial patterns? Mm -hmm. Real simple. Takes two minutes. Just click on the. You know, do they have a deep bite? Do they have a moderate deep bite, or is it over over jet over bite normal? Okay. So you kind of do all those few little things. Try to keep it as simple as possible. Now, what we want to do is do that on every child and then come in. Jerry Simmons has, are you familiar with the sleep image ring? This is an aura ring, yep. but there's one called sleep image yep. that's out there. Jerry has taken that and with some manipulation of the software and the algorithm, he can bring out more information out of that ring, cardiopulmonary coupling, heart mm. rate ability and some other stuff that maybe it could possibly take the place of polysonography because mm. it's coming out with more. Now, not getting all the brain waves. But then what we want to do is do that on these children, but also do pediatric polysonography. On mm -hmm. mm. So we want to get the total range of this and what we want to do throughout the country, get maybe six or 800 or a thousand kids that we could do. Yep. Fill out the form, fill out the dental information, get the sleep image data, get the polysonography data. Now we can relate that, uh, that five questionnaire yep. to the ring, to the polysonography, relate the, what the sleep image ring says to the polysonography, yep. how well does that correlate? Can you, could you see a child, they check off, yes, you give them the sleep image ring, go home and sleep in it for three nights and come up with some information. Mm -hmm. David Gazal, who is the uh, chairman, I mean, he is the dean of the medical school at Marshall University. He is now the most prolific author in the world on sleep apnea mm -hmm. after Dr. Gimeno died. He's one of the co-editors of my book. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So he's working on urine-based biomark. Mm. There's, certain, there's certain things that are secreted in the urine, of blood and urine of, of people that have sleep at. Mm. So there's a lot of things going on out there that could make it a lot easier. Because number one, it's hard to get polysonography on kids. And yes. most most sleep clinics don't do children. Right. They're not geared to do it. Right. And they're not looking at RERAs and mo motion and, right. and mobility. They're literally just looking at an AHI index. AHI. Which, yes. And I, yeah. most of the children have upper airway resistance. Yep. Which doesn't show up. Exactly. Or some form of sleep disorder breathing on the scale, sure, which again is not going to show up. What is doing to pick, he uses what's called PEZ. He runs a, a sensor down the nose at the level of the heart, down the esophagus. Esophageal okay. manometry is what right. it is. Okay. So it's measuring pressure. So he can pick up upper airway resistance, mm. but it's it's a different, you know, it's, a, it's an additional thing that most people don't do with polysonography. Mm -hmm. It's called PES. Uh, esophageal pressure manometry is what okay. it is. And, but that correlates to full-phase rhinomanomacy. Mm. And K Karen, we need to get Karen on here sometime to talk mm -hmm. about that because full-phase rhinomanometry correlates to what you see in the polysonography, maybe even better. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be something that kind of takes the place of, but anyway, but the, going back to the, to the cast committee and the CGAR is, so what we want to do is we want to come up with, with a number of uh, 
offices mm-hmm. that will that can start doing. It. Now we'll have to, you know, get all the, the sleep image rings. No problem because that can be sent. Yeah. That's actually sent by Jerry. It's analyzed by Jerry. But then in in different communities, we're going to have to work with getting, you know, pediatric PSG. That's as you're saying. I'm like that's going to be the hard part. <laughs> that's yeah. the hard part, yep. and that's what's yep. going to take the money. Yeah, because that's going to be the biggest expense trying yep. to get that done and figuring out. Luckily, where I am, actually in Auburn, Alabama, the, the sleep doc. He does a lot with pediatrics, so mm. it works. It'll be a perfect combination, and I'm gonna talk to the pedi- you know pediatric dentist about trying to get on board with this thing. So there's a lot of stuff going on that I think will eventually help answer some of these questions in the right way. I have the data, the data that, that we can actually hang our hat on. Yeah which yeah. we don't have right now. So there's no way to really do the study long-term kind of thing like right. would necessary, but we can do a snippet like yep. this. Yep. We just got to, we got to figure out where the money's going to be. And we're working on that. We have some leads into some NIH money and we're trying to look through all those kind of things because it's going to be a big study. Oh we're yeah. It's a pilot project as we speak. I love it. And if there's anything I can do to help or to get the word out through this audience or this platform, you let me know. We'll put Jerry's email in the um, notes and anyone and listening. What, what might be a good idea sometime is maybe have Steve Carstensen and Jerry do a yeah. podcast. Get them out to talk about it. I'll, I love really, it. Really, really yep. more about it. Try to get yep. some people excited because here's coming from a dental side. Now, Steve mainly treats adults. I treat both. I treat all of them and, and Jerry's kind of the, the MD side, which gives it that medical credibility. Really, yeah. two of the editors of my book, David Gazal, like I said, is the, the, the uh, dean of the medical school, the most prolific author in the world on sleep apnea now. And then David McIntosh is a pediatric mm, yep. ENT in, in Australia. Yep. And I would I would try to get him on. You have to get to – Australia is about 15 hours ahead, but anyway. But uh, – but he's he's one of my co-editors. Both of them are co-editors. And Jerry's co-author, Steve Carstensen, Audrey Yoon, Stanley Liu, who is the head of otolaryngology at Stanford's got a chapter, and Eric Thuler. And anyway, I've got a lot of medical. When I started having a dream about this book, I said, I want to write a book that kind of puts medicine and dentistry back together in the airway because that's really where we overlap. Yep, completely agree. And so then I started thinking, all right, who do I need to get yep. to do it? And so I I, I didn't know David Gazal from Adam. <laughs> I called him up one day and I, I got through to him finally and started telling him my idea and all that. And man, it was like, how can I be a part of this? Wow. Because I, you're exactly dead on the money trying to do this thing so then it just kind of snowballed and that's great yes if you wouldn't mind fin- kind of finishing up here wrapping up tell a little bit more about what is in the book what we can expect uh, and we've touched on it some but kind of what's the general theme of the text and then um what's the the hope and the bigger vision of that it will help providers uh, who, who purchase it and read it yeah the the title of it is growing into breathing problems the quest for collaborative lifetime solutions so mm-hmm. the title it kind of it doesn't say anything about pediatric or adult, but it, mm-hmm. the insinuation there, that's the whole point of it. So uh, we talk about the history. We go back, you know, I, I've got a whole chapter about orthodontics and <laughs> how, it, how, it, how it really uh, started with that and all the history of, of where it started. It actually, if you look back, uh, it even starts back in 12,000 years ago, things mm-hmm. were about this in, in uh, ancient literature, but uh, but I've got a lot with Kevin Boyd does a lot on the Industrial Revolution, how that changed mm-hmm. the and diet, us, you know, the allergies, the allergens, and all this stuff that started. You know, wh- where is the genesis of this? Where, yes. When did it start? I mean, just a few hundred years ago. You don't have to go back millions. Of years, no, but if you look at the yeah, if you look at the skulls and and. Kevin Boyd and Mariana Evans yep. actually went, you know, did a lot of study at the University of Pennsylvania. 
But if you look at those old skulls, I mean, they got big, you know, they got big air. Now, you have to extrapolate and say, well, that, yeah, they probably could breathe better, mm. you know, obviously. But still, things were different. Yep. They had no malocclusion no. to speak of. No. Ang- so, Angle's old glory, right? The uh... Angle's old glory skull. <laughs> So Kevin, Kevin and John Hayes have got that. And then we've got myofunctional therapist, uh, Sharon Moore from Australia, Nick, uh, Nicole Gofarb, mm. and some others. And Dwayne Grumman's is doing a whole chapter on reverse face mask mm-hmm. and TFJ. Uh, John Mark Retrave, we've got a whole chapter on artificial intelligence and orthodontics and how that may relate. And then we got a lot on surgical stuff, uh, the surgical the MMA surgery. We've got early, you know, like uh, early surgery. Audrey Yoon, Stanley Lou talk about surgery first. Mm-hmm. Eric Thuler talks about uh, surgery for the transverse. Uh, Risa Movahead talks about total joint replacement, mm-hmm. how that affects uh, sleep. And all so we and we've got actually a chapter on insurance, mm. and I got another chapter on from uh, Ken Burley, who's a uh, he's a general dentist that does sleep, and he's also a lawyer. Okay, he and Steve Carson wrote a book together. Okay, about dental sleep medicine, but he he talks about risk management, the law, okay. the you know, the, great the legal part of it. So we got a lot of different chapters in there about a lot of different things. It's supposed to come out probably the end of this year. It's going to be published by Springer okay. in late 2004. We're, they're in the process now of editing it. So we're in the editing process as we speak. <laughs> okay. Well, that's sounds absolutely fascinating. And I will uh, be happy to uh, promote that and 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 reference it when it does come out for people um, because providing that information, I mean, the, the names you just listed and, and what experts, anybody who has done anything in the arena of of sleep or craniofacial growth and development, it, it knows the majority, if not all, of the names you just you just referenced. They're all people who are very well known and and very prominent uh, and, and highly respected. So I give you a tremendous amount of credit for putting something like that together. I I cannot imagine that that was an easy <laughs> task. I'm hurting cats. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and thank you to all of them who participated yeah. in it because all of them are obviously very busy. But this is what needs to happen to start to assimilate some of this data and information from the experts so that we have resources when, as we've talked about, people. People say, oh, what you're talking about, you know, there's really nothing to that. Or, no, no, there is a lot to it. And um, and not just empirically speaking from the patients I treated in my practice, which isn't irrelevant, but I understand doesn't necessarily have the same impact or effect as, hey, look, this is what a series of experts across almost every medical and dental discipline have to say, uh, any, anything that touches the sleep arena have, have to say on this. Um, and I think that's just going to be a huge contribution to the profession and to, to, to these patients. That's the thing is at the end of this discussion uh, that we all have, there's a patient there in, in, in that's the that's part, the part. Of right. I mean, it, we can argue, we can debate on the way you do it and which appliance you use or, you know, what age within a certain year, but to deny the impact that as orthodontists we can have mm-hmm. on these young growing faces and relegate them to just straightening teeth as teenagers, because that's what we've been taught, or that's what kind of fits easiest, as you said before, very well into the system of our practice is so beneath us. And, and, uh, I love what you're doing. And, um, I really, I want to thank you for being on the show, for taking the time to explain all of that, uh, truly fascinating and, and the history and, and that you, for all the years you've been practicing that you continue to have this passion and, and work to change lives. It's just, it's just awesome. So thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Share my thoughts. Uh, my, absolutely. My pleasure. I really, really enjoyed it. So Dr. Bill Harrell, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Mike. Take care. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of the Doc Podcast. Be sure to visit theorthocoach.com to get access to ADA SERP recognized CE courses or to schedule a private one-on-one coaching session with me. And remember to join the Doc community on Facebook for more great content designed to help you succeed both personally and professionally. Just go to Facebook, search for the Doc community, and request admission into the group. You can also find Doc on Instagram at at the ortho coach. 
And always remember, you have been blessed with the ability to do amazing things.